Thank you for tuning into the Buyer's Guide podcast, where we continue to talk all things property and finance. My name is Peter Mastriani, the founder of the Buyer's Guide, and in today's cast, I have the opportunity to speak with Shane Hiscock, who is one of Brisbane's leading buyer's agents. Shane has really been heavily involved within the Southeast Queensland property space for several years, and there's no doubting he knows enough to be dangerous when it comes to actually spotting value and opportunity within Southeast Queensland. With his clients and investors, Shane has about $45 million worth of small development projects currently in the pipeline. So he's really a great person to get the inside scoop and the current pulse of the Brisbane development space. So let's get to it. Shane, hi. Thank you very much for joining us on the Buyer's Guide podcast. It's great to have you on the show. My pleasure, Peter, and thanks for inviting me on the show. Hey, no problems at all. Shane, we've spoken on a couple of occasions now, and uh, uh, you're one of the the leading buyer's agents within the the Brisbane marketplace at this point in time. So why don't you start off and uh, tell our listeners a a little bit about your background and, and how you got into the property game? Yeah, yeah, love to. So um, my background is I grew up in um, in country New South Wales and studied a business degree at university down there. And after that, oh, yeah. had no real clue about what I wanted to do. So As I sort of headed to the big smoke and uh, you know just thought I'd try IT actually. Okay. And, um, why not? Gave it a crack yeah. and um, end up working for a very large IT company called IBM, which a lot of people yeah. might know. Um, great company, a lot of opportunities, but you know, sort of ten years into it, I I realised that it wasn't something that I really loved. IT wasn't something I had a passion for, and um, it was kind of upon realising that that I started looking for, you know, what is it that I really enjoy? What can I go and do in my life that I love? What can I do that, um, you know, I'll be a good example to my children? You know, I really want mm-hmm. to teach them to follow their dreams and and do what they're passionate about. So I figured um, I'd better start, um, you know, walking the talk, I guess you'd say. And um, we didn't have kids at the time, but, you know, I was uh, we were obviously planning that. And uh, it was when my wife and I started looking for our first house together okay. here in Brisbane. Yep. Uh, we, we narrowed down a few suburbs. Uh, one of them was, what did we have? We had Mitchelton. Yep. Uh, what else do we have? Everton Park, and I'm trying to think of the third. I know it wasn't Stafford because my wife said she doesn't want to live anywhere named after a dog. So <laughs> okay. So it wasn't Stafford. Nothing yeah. to do with nothing wrong with Staffies, you know. Yeah. But, um, so where did where did you end uh, up at the time? Anyway, we ended up in uh, Everton Park okay. and uh, bought our first property there in 2005. Okay, and a good really time just, to buy back in Brisbane then. Yeah, it was it was pretty good. Uh, and I, I really, I went for land content. We bought a block on a thousand square meter, house of a thousand square wow. meters. Yeah. Um, and I just loved the process. You know, it was, you know, being from IT, you know, not that I have an IT training. I trained in, I had a business degree, but I still have a bit of analytical nature to, to how I do things. And so narrowing down suburbs and then trying to compare areas and understand growth and all of those sorts of things became a bit of a game. And you and did so, this research yourself at the time, being a first home buyer, that was your approach? I, I asked because you said yeah. that you went for land content. Yep. Uh, so how did that, I guess, to play on that analytical mind of yours, what was the, was there a, a method to, to your approach at the time or you just kind of sniffed it out as you went along? Yeah, there was, I, I'd started learning at that point, you know, reading about it and I really started looking at properties and seeing, you know, what someone paid for it sort of 10 years earlier and trying to understand whether certain, you know, areas were growing better than others. But I realised then, well, I just thought then, you know, you can't sort of go wrong with land. You know, the, the, yeah. the old saying is they're not making any more of it. Sure. And, yeah. and, you know, as you as the city, you know, Everton Park's within sort of 10K kind of ring and everyone would understand there's not a lot of new land that becomes available in that sort of area. So I figured, well, you know, it's, it's got to have a pretty good chance of, of growth if I can pick something that's on a, a decent sized block of land. That was, um, you know, probably the extent of my 
No, I did a lot of research, but that was kind of what it boiled down to at the okay. time. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I did get from it was that I loved it, and it was really fun. It was just, you know, I think my wife got over it after <laughs> the third month of going to open homes every weekend. Yeah. But um, I, was, I, was, I was loving it. Every weekend, we'd jump in the car, do about five, six open homes, driving around to, you know, each different one, checking it out, looking at the streets. Uh, and I think she was sort of getting over it, but... I, I quite loved it and, and then started to just pick up more, you know, knowledge and education around property. So, you mm-hmm. know, read property investor magazines and um, finding little courses I could go to here and there. And um, I, I got on to, I remember I got on to uh, Steve McKnight. You might have heard of Steve McKnight. He's yeah. written those books, Zero to 130 Properties in Three and a Half Years and a few other follow-on books. Uh, so I read Steve's uh, works and then, Started doing a, a program of his called the Results Mentoring Program, which was about you know value adding to property and about you know teaching you the fundamentals of property investing, and um, that kind of got me. That, that's what I what kind of got me all started, and okay. you know that's how it all happened. Yeah. Sure. So uh, from Evident Park, when uh, when was the turning point? I, I guess for you professionally to to move on from from IBM and. Uh, and, and move into uh, becoming a, a buyer's advocate as a, as a profession? Well, what, what I'd done was um, we bought that first property and then I really was, as I mentioned, on, on, had the bug then, so I was really keen. I started to build a bit of a, a plan, like a bit of a wealth creation plan as mm-hmm. to how I would sort of buy properties that had potential to be developed was my plan at the time. Okay. And, um, you know, buy, buy them and allow the capital growth to happen and then buy another one. And allow the capital growth and buy another one. So that was my that was my plan at the time, and um, and also well, p- part of the plan. Another part was to look for something where I could initially get a bit of a bigger uh, injection of capital, I guess. So that was, should have mentioned that that was the first step. So I wanted to do sort of like a reno project or a small development to increase my capital, so I could you know keep keep buying properties basically. So I um, I tried to do. Not, I tried to make a whole bunch of renovation projects stack up and found that quite difficult. So I ended up leaning towards construction type projects mm-hmm. and um, I found myself a block of land in a suburb called McDowell, mm-hmm. in, um, which is not far from Everton Park. Yeah. There was a small subdivision happening there of 12 lots and we picked up one of the sort of last few lots for $217,000. Um, so that was, that was a pretty good price. And that was my start into, you know, the development sort of space, which is something else we do. And um, I got started on that project, and it was while we were doing that where I, I kind of came to the realisation that um, I was at, at an IT conference and sitting there at day two, I think it was, down in Sydney, listening to a whole bunch of talks about various technologies that were coming up, and I was just totally uninterested, just I couldn't be in a worse place. It was, it was, I was falling asleep and just thinking, <laughs> what am I doing here? This is yeah. not where I want to be. That you was know? your aha uh-huh moment. This is my wake up call. Yeah. yeah. I was like, this is just, you know, if I don't change something now, I'm going to be sitting in this, doing this again in five years, 10 years, whatever. Yeah. You know, it's just going to, I can see where it ends up because you just have to look around a big organization like that and, and look, and you'll find what's happened to the people that decided not to make any changes. So, that afternoon, um, my boss was down there at the time for the conference. I gave him a call and I asked if I could meet him the next morning for breakfast. And um, so we met for breakfast early before the conference started and I said, um, his name's John, uh, still, a, still a friend of mine now and I really trusted him. And I said, John, I've decided I'm going to leave IBM. And uh, so I'm, I'm handing you my resignation and I resigned but not, in, not until 12 months. <laughs> Okay. So I was like, I'm resigning in 12 months. And he's, he was, I think he was taken back a little bit. He went, well, that's pretty interesting. What do you, you know, thanks for the notice. And what, what, <laughs> yeah. do, what are you going to do? Yeah. And I said, I don't, I don't know, but it will be something to do with property. Yeah. And he said, wow, that's great. I'm really glad you, you know, I hate to see you leave, but I'm really glad you're following your dreams. And, yeah. um, you know, so, so from then what happened was I, I completed that construction in McDowell. Um, I went through all the, things that you shouldn't sort of do. So I learned a lot of lessons in that one. The GFC came along and we had a builder that changed form in seven times and oh, got a most attached yeah. to a project. And yeah, okay. There's a few fun things that happened along the way there. But 
what led me to sort of you know helping others in property was I made enough money from that project allowed me to not have to work for a little period you know for a period of time and I decided I'd take my chance so I did resign at the time John had moved on from being my boss at that point uh, I resigned and then went okay what am I what am I going to do now I know that's property and then what happened was I started to get you know people from from my work where I previously worked at IBM sort of saying to me hey we're we're looking to buy this what what do you think and I would mm-hmm. do some analysis on uh it was a, at the time it was a townhouse on the south side one of the ladies was looking to buy and I said look it's yeah, it's new and it looks nice and it's it's you know really pretty it's a townhouse however if you can afford it you know there's probably better investments because three doors up you know there's an approval going through for another 24 townhouses so supply and demand tells me that your townhouse is probably not going to go up in the next five years to mm-hmm. ten to ten years because you've just you know tripled the supply in the street so how about we do something else for you and and find you a, a what if we find and i thought i'd find her a block of land and help her build something and um and so we went and we went and did that but that was sort of one of my first um deals and that's when she said well how do i how do i pay you and at this point i said well i don't really know you know, it's it's up to you. You decide. Yeah, okay, okay. I'll, I'll just do the work. I really love doing this stuff. Yeah. Um, was that another one of the lessons learned along the way of business? Or, uh, yeah, I've learned that work, lesson. <laughs> work out how to monetize uh, your, yeah. your strategy going forward to to get paid. Mm. Yeah, probably have a think about that a bit more. You know, yeah. for the future. <laughs> but um, you know, to to her, like she she was great. You know, yeah, friend yeah. from I, really great person to work with, and she said. At the you know after we um, purchased the property for her, she handed me an envelope with six grand in it, and um, I went, "Wow, that's that's pretty cool." Because we bought her a block of land, and she said, "Well, that's I researched it, and and this what you've done and how you've helped me was pretty much what uh, someone like a buyer's agency would do." So I just figured I'd pay you that fee, and I went, "Wow, that's pretty cool." And then the light went, "Oh, maybe I should do a bit more of this." Mm-hmm. So that's how it started. Okay, that's, okay. That's how it started. And, uh, and from that start, you've been uh, pretty active in, in the Brisbane market, as I know, as as have I. Um, and uh, look, I, I think it's probably a, a meeting of mine for, for you and I that um, Brisbane's gearing up, or, or South East Queensland in, in particular. So in your opinion, you know, what, what's the attraction of, of Brisbane at this point in time for you know, residents within South East Queensland as, as a corridor or, or perhaps interstate investors? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think Brisbane um, has been fairly flat for, for a reasonable amount of time. And um, what I'm noticing, because we're out sort of buying properties, you know, regularly, is properties that would have been worth 500000 last year are worth six hundred this year. And it's it's happening right around us and right in front of us. And it's... um. I'm noticing as well I am often – there are often Sydney buyers coming in to compete with us to buy properties up here. I think from their perspective, um, anyone in Sydney who owned a property in the last five years has just doubled their money. Mm-hmm. So they're, the Sydney siders who own homes are sitting on a great amount of equity right now and looking to potentially invest that somewhere. And if you look around the markets in Australia – um, Perth's not doing so great right now. Melbourne has been having a great run. The questions are how long will that go? Um, Brisbane, I think, is very much poised for some growth. I'm not saying it's going to go crazy. And I think it's, you've got to be careful about what you buy and where you buy it. Absolutely. For me, yeah. for me, um, uh, our focus is sort of in, in the inner ring. So we're 10 Ks. Maybe 12 if we're lucky, but 10 k's and in typically. Okay. Um, so we're not investing or buying into large, uh, large land estates on the outskirts as much, like uh-huh. well, at all actually. So we're, we're sticking to the inner ring and we're sticking to houses or, you know, or townhouses. But if you can afford houses with land content, clearly go with that. If, um, if that's not something in your price range, then, uh, townhouses are good. And we're also, um, we're developing a lot of projects in there for clients who are, mm-hmm. you know, might be wanting to accelerate a portfolio. So they'll, we'll help them buy a property that can then add a couple of townhouses on the back, for example. Um, and that seems to be a good strategy. They can sell one down, pick another one up. But back to how do I see Brisbane going? I've, you know, I've done a lot of, um, analysis and looked back over time and, 
you know, I've noticed that Brisbane tends to sort of, you know, bounce a couple of years after Sydney seems to start easing off when market, when the Sydney market's grown. So, and I think, you know, Sydney, although it's sort of kicked again at the start of this year, I think is probably getting toward the top. So, Absolutely. you know, I feel, I actually thought it was probably at the top in November, December, but I've noticed clearance rates have sort of jumped back up pretty high now. So maybe it's got to have its last little legs. Uh, and currently we're at about half price of Sydney. And the last time that we were sort of half price of Sydney was in 2001. And if people remember what happened in Brisbane around end of 2001, 2002, it's when we, we had quite a big jump in property prices and sort of it, it grew up until about, you know, 2006, seven from being 40% of the Sydney price to about 78% of the Sydney price. So, you know, I guess I see Brisbane having some just solid growth in it for those inner ring suburbs over the next, you know, three, four years. And I think probably now is a good time to get in because if you wait two years, then there's sort of two years of growth you possibly missed out on. So. Yeah, that's that's my thoughts on it. Yeah. So a, a couple of things that you've just said there. You said twelve months ago, five hundred thousand uh, dollar dwellings or properties. They're probably now pricing at at six. Hypothetically, mm-hmm. is that mm-hmm. because those uh, properties that you're looking at have development potential and and there's uh, more of an arm wrestle going on for for investors to find those sites, or or is that uh, just on growth alone that you're seeing? That that particular like that's a lot around the development potential sites. They're yes. definitely been growing, you know, pretty strongly. However, I think it's uh, it just flows down into your more regular types of properties following that normally, right? So, you know, typically back into developers are earliest into the market. Then you know your investors and then you sort of late people who are sort of picking it up a bit late. But yeah, definitely development sites. I mean, I looked at. You know, I've looked at sites to buy for development and they're pretty hard to make them stack now if you want to just develop and on sell it because their, their purchase price has increased quite a bit. Yes. Uh, however, if you wanted to buy it and still sit there or just build a couple of things and hold them, mm. then it's still, you know, your, your equity gain potential is still pretty good because you're, yeah. fa- you're not factoring in, uh, sales costs and GST, which is a big component of it. So. I'm finding that at the moment. I'm uh, doing a, a small lot subdivision at uh, Mary Cravat and um, yep. getting the DA through the Brisbane City Council and uh, having an arm wrestle with them to to actually get the approval in place has um, cost me pretty significantly. Not from a monetary perspective, but the way that the site now looks, they've they've really butchered my block in terms of some of the conditions that uh, I had to meet to appease their. Uh, their requirements and if I hadn't owned the property for the duration of time that I had I would probably yep. be losing money if I was to then proceed ahead with uh, the, the new builds that um, I'm going ahead with just on the basis that I know that I would have paid 600,000 or 625 yeah. for, for the site mm-hmm. plus my plus my purchasing costs plus the DA costs plus everything else that goes on top by the time you get a build on you know you're um you're getting up there and whether or not you'd still get a, a reasonable return would probably be questionable. So yeah, uh, what, what are you seeing in, uh, from individuals that you're dealing with in terms of perhaps their investment strategies that they're deploying in Brisbane? Um, I'm seeing that there's uh, we've already started to help start helping Sydney buyers. So I'm seeing okay. Sydney buyers who are looking to buy up here just looking to um, sort of land bank almost. So, right. they're, you know, they look up here and say you can buy for six, $700,000. Um, you know, in the right spots you can buy a decent house on a 600-square-metre block of land um, that, you know, you'd be lucky to buy a one-bedroom unit sort of yeah. five days from the city of Sydney with yeah. 600 grand. So, yeah. You're getting um, a mansion up here in Brisbane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, you're getting a mansion. So we're starting to help those kinds of guys and then also – um, where the, the guys that are sort of wanting to just maybe add a couple of townhouses or just build a couple of houses, sell one, keep one, that sort of okay. strategy is, um, I believe, coming becoming a bit more popular and we're starting to see a bit more interest around that. So it's, it's more your regular investment type of product and some small development. Um, we've got like our, 
at, at the moment as a as a business we're running 20 small development projects mm. so we've we know like the one that you spoke about we've got those sorts of projects as well as building houses and townhouses and stuff like that so um but we picked those sites up a year ago do you know what I mean like okay yeah you know, so the ones they're they're building and selling those sort of projects and yes. if you were to buy a lot of those today the numbers on today's numbers are not stacking to build it and sell it Yes. So they're making more sense. But we're, a lot of those we're building there to sell are all um, luxury as well. They're high ends. We're okay. focusing on the owner occupier buyer. So we're spending a lot more on the on the product. However, when you when I've I've remodeled some of those those purchases that we've made and just put sort of a more basic build on a lot of them and it makes more sense at the moment to build them and you maybe sell one and keep the other. And you, you pick up some equity and your cash flow is improved because you've you've dropped your debt down on the remaining properties that you keep. Mm-hmm. So it becomes a better proposition for a longer term kind of play. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, and then if you can't if you're not able to sort of move into the development space though, I'm always you know an advocate again of the land size. So we try and buy in as close as we can you know to the city. For, for as big a piece of land as we can get. So try and get a 600 as close as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or if need be, we either move out or be happy to buy on a smaller lot in close. And then it becomes more about making sure you know the streets and the areas of the suburbs, you know, which, cause you know, like you would know from your experience, Peter, like, you know, you know, streets, some streets are good. Some streets are not. Um, others are really sought after in a suburb. So if you can buy sort of the, the worst house in the best street situation. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, so there's some of the strategies that we're seeing play out at the moment in the market up here. Okay, and and mm-hmm. and from those strategies, um, bit crystal ball, but I'll ask regardless. But what do you feel will be the the future trends or, or emerging trends that are coming into the the Brisbane marketplace at this point in time? If if a lot of investors are coming into the market and and looking at land banking or or uh, looking at more higher end. Uh, developments for owner occupier types. Um, h- how do you foresee things playing out in the next couple of years of those factors? Oh, I think um, I think there's a few parts and a few speeds to this market up here. I think the for me, you, I'm staying away from units. Okay. Um, so we've got one block of units to build, but it's um, it's a small block owner occupier level units again, all with city views, a few k's from the city. Yeah. Um, so you know, really sort of specialised. Yeah. Um, nice but I see sounds like a nice boutique development. Yeah, very boutique. Um, all sort of oversized, you know, much larger yeah. than your normal size units. Um, with really nice sort of you know Carrara marble kitchens in them, and you know, all sorts of sure. kind of high end features. So I think I think what I'll see playing out up here is that your owner occupier market is is I think just going to go reasonably well and tick along. I've noticed in the in the suburbs that are you know you're you're inside 10k, inside even six to eight k, have all seem to be just going quite strongly. The newer homes that have finished well, that are done properly, have been getting some really good prices and selling quite quickly. Um, townhouses as well seem to be going reasonably well. What what we've tried to do with a lot of the projects that we've got now is to position products into a suburb that doesn't have a lot of that product at the moment. Okay. So. You know, we're in more, you know, we're in more traditional like Ascots, Clayfields, sure. um, St. Lucia, you know, these sort of, you know, nice suburbs where, you know, to buy a house, uh, you know, you pay some really high prices to buy, if you wanted a townhouse though, um, they're all 20 years old. Mm-hmm. So we're positioning some townhouses in the middle where they're, we've got bigger townhouses that we're constructing okay. that are, um, a nice spec level, not as expensive as a house. Um, not as much maintenance, not as much to look after. Um, so I think you know, but you could the, sort of see the, it. the fundamentals for growth on on those type of properties though would, uh, are going to be really outstanding. You're, you're going to be buying into a, a blue chip area, an investment grade location, mm. and, and an investment grade property, albeit at a, at a cheaper price point. Um, but get the, the the location and 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 the street and and the product right. Um, yeah. yeah, that that'll definitely move for sure. But, that's right. And that's, so, you know, that's the sort of strategy if we're doing some small development that we're looking at. And if not, um, we're focusing on that sort of land content because the other thing I've noticed, you know, from doing this for a few years is that, um, 
as the inner suburbs get sort of cut up into the 400 square meter lot sizes. Yes. The, um, the, there's plenty of families though that don't want to live on a 400 square meter lot. So the, if you've got a property that's 600 square meters, it becomes rare and the price of that goes up. So, you know, we just, we just bought a property for an investor in Sydney, uh, who was, didn't want to do the development thing later on down the track, but wanted something that would grow. So we found a property that was, um, it was a post-war, Queenslander home, four bedrooms with a study with a sort of reasonably newish kitchen, um, on 600 square meters near, you know, across the road from Parklands, close to transport, 10 k's from the city, yeah. um, for 571,000 we picked it up for. So right. for that, Can, you know, do you I mind look, me asking where, where where that was located? Which suburb? Ah, uh, that was in Everton Park. That was in Everton Park again. It sounds like yeah. goodbye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, really good buy. And I know from being a developer and doing this stuff as well for others that, um, what we can, what they can build on there in the future, what kind of house can fit on that block and the sort of street that it's in where all of the other blocks are 600s as well. It'll become a desirable spot if mm. nice big family homes on it in five, ten years, you know. So it's potential for growth over buying something else in the suburb on a 400 is a greater potential, you know. So, um, that's sort of where I see the strategies playing out. Although I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of stock, I think, being built up here. Obviously in the unit space, I think that's a bit risky. Um, yeah. and then there's a lot in the outlying suburbs with house and land packages and stuff like that. So that's obviously, you know, where, what you can do depends on what you can afford. Yes. So, you know, if you're in the inner ring, I know it's more expensive and it's often, um, it's often more expensive to hold these properties because they're not new, so you don't have depreciation um, and you don't have the higher rents that can come in on a new property. So that you've got to kind of weigh it up, but I think if you can afford it, you're going to get a far better capital growth uh, situation if you can stay you know, in closer. And let's face it, cap- the growth allows you to the capital growth allows you to grow, like it allows you to you know buy the next one. It allows you to um, you know, do the next thing. If you, if you just buy a property based on it not costing you much to own, then it's no use if that property doesn't go up in value in the next five or ten years. Like it's, mm. it just doesn't matter if it's cost you, you know, a hundred bucks a year to own it because you got a tax write off. If you, if it doesn't grow and you don't pay off that principal, then you, you, it's a nil sum game at the end of ten years. So. Yeah. I think, uh, from, from, uh, from what you just said then, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of uh, pursuing capital growth. But uh, if you, you are looking at perhaps a, a strategy where you are doing a development, doing a, a block splitter and whether you sell off the land or you do the development um, and pay down that debt uh, to, mm-hmm. to uh, help, I guess, from a cash flow perspective while still holding a, a quality asset um, yep. could be a very reasonable strategy to deploy. Yep, I totally agree with that one. And we're, you know, we're doing that around here, you know, in a, you know, quite a bit. We've got a, like a three townhouse one we're doing where it's an old house. We renovate it, build two townhouses on the back. It's, um, great project to sell one or two and keep one or two. So if you, yep. if you sold, sold two and keep one, you end up with a really low debt on the one that you've kept. You recycle uh, most, if not all of your equity back out. Yeah. And, and you can go do it again. And then we're doing a, yeah, you know, I'm doing another similar one. I do this stuff myself as well. I'm mm-hmm. doing one, um, in Wilston where we'll, nice. um, we build, we've got a house to renovate, like an old Queenslander that's a character home. We lift it up, slide yep. it forward, build in underneath and turn it into a, you know, a large townhouse basically. And then we've got oh, three, yeah. uh, three three story townhouses on the back. Right. And, um, because it's in such a great spot, um, we'll just, we'll sell two and we'll keep two. Yeah. Perfect strategy, great cash flow at the end. Equity is available in there, and you get a, you, you, you actually lift your equity quite a bit, you know, by doing that sort of project. So, absolutely, That's yeah, it's good, ex- good accelerator, you know. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. So, if uh, I'm a, a Sydney or a Melbourne or, or even a Brisbane listener or a WA listener or wherever we may be uh, located, how can uh, we get in contact with you, Shane? Find out a bit more about what you do and uh, opportunities that are in Southeast Queensland at the moment. Well, probably there's a couple of ways. So, we've um, you can call us on on our number. I'll give you the number now if that's all right. Yeah, go for it's, it. Yeah, it's um one three hundred. 
eight eight three seven two nine. Or you can also visit our website, which is it's just www.shanehiscockproperty.com.au. So I'll, I'll spell that. It's S H A N E H I S C O C K Property. Dot com dot au. Uh, they're probably the best two ways mm-hmm. uh, of getting in contact with us, mm-hmm. and uh, we'd be, you know, we can just jump on the phone. Really, I find is the best thing, and understand uh, your situation and what you're looking for, and we can just uh, advise on how we might be able to help. And if if we can't help, try and point you in the right direction anyway. So that's great. Oh, well, Shane, thank you very much for. Uh giving us, uh, I, I guess, a, a pulse on, on the South East Queensland marketplace. It's been really good to have you on the show and uh, look forward to having you on again so we can get a, a future update of uh, what's um, in vogue in South East Queensland. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter, and thanks thanks for your time, and thank you to everyone else who's um, also uh, taken their time out to have a listen to this. I really appreciate it. Good stuff. Thanks a lot, Shane. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. That concludes another episode of the Buyer's Guide podcast. Thank you for tuning in and providing the continued support to help grow and uh, encourage me to uh, provide more content from other experienced uh, property and and finance professionals alike. As I said last week, uh, the feedback that I received from this podcast is extremely positive. So thanks again for for everyone, for for your likes, for your shares, for for your five-star ratings and, and comments. Not only do I appreciate it, I most certainly encourage it as well. So, look, be sure to subscribe, not to miss out on any future episodes. We've got a a great lineup of, of future guests to come onto the show. And have a great week. So, until next time, bye bye.